once again to EW10's bookmark. Our special guest author, a great friend, radio and television host, Teresa Tamio. Book Beyond Sunday, Becoming a 24-7 Catholic, along with a study guide published by OSV, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. Always good to see good you to in see person. You we get Thanks to talk on the radio on the every yes, Friday. Every so that's, Friday for your that's, inside that's, word. That's, that's, that, that's always fun, etc. And of course, you're down here at the time we're taping this for uh, taping new episodes of the Catholic, Catholic View, for, View for, for Women, women which we Janet, really appreciate you, and, you supporting uh, us. And okay. it's been nine seasons already. Do you that's believe it? That's great. Yeah. And uh, beyond Sunday, becoming a 24 7 Catholic, most of our people have trouble getting to Mass on Sunday many times, and now somehow you're putting, a, you're putting a bigger obligation on people. Is this really a good idea? Yes, because if you don't go beyond Sunday, then Sunday doesn't mean much at all, because we, we have the Eucharist as source and summit of our faith, but if we don't build on the graces from the sacraments, we're missing mm -hmm. out on a great life and adventure with right. Christ, which is what I found. Now, our good friend Al Cresta, uh, he does the uh, forward. Obviously, yes. people hear Al on our, our radio network as well. Success in one of America's largest television markets had been suffocating Teresa Tamio's once lively Catholic faith. Now, you were a Catholic, you were raised Catholic. Did you actually have a lively Catholic faith, would you say, I, I think that was kind of pushed under right. by working in the media or? Definitely. I mean, I, I think growing up Catholic, and um, I had a very good uh, experience in Catholic grade school. I had great sisters, religious, and, and great lay teachers. And so I was very uh, much involved in, mm -hmm. at that level uh, in grade school, somewhat in high school, still going to Mass, but it kind of dwindled because I found that at a very early age that, that I was going to go into communications. I felt a big mm -hmm. pull into communications after the sisters put me on the stage in the oh, third okay. grade to read a poem. And I was like, oh, I love this. And that's when I decided I was going into Do the they media. regret that decision? Uh, probably. <laughs> I would think so. Although I did get an award when I, a, a few years ago from the grade school. But oh, there a you successful go. So alum, that's but, right, that's right. but yeah, it was, I, I, I love the Lord. I, I mean, I, I, I knew about Jesus. I wouldn't say I, I knew an understanding of, of what it meant to have a real relationship with him. But but I had a very Catholic family, very Catholic upbringing. Right. But then by the time and I got to college. And you also had actually decent nuns. Yes, we had decent nuns. We hear these yes, stories yes. today. There are so yeah, much I never had that. stories. I never had any of that. I mean, the right. nuns were, were very, I mean, as a matter of fact, when I went to school, they were still in, in the full habit, right, which was exactly, really nice. It right. changed by the time I graduated from eighth grade, but I had a good experience. It was just that the pull right. of the world was way too strong. Right. And at that time, you know, when I was growing up, uh, in uh, I was born in 59, so I'm 58 years old, mm -hmm. soon to be 60. So back then, that was when the radical feminism yeah, and sure. the push for women, especially in broadcast news, right, as you remember, right. Marlene Sanders, Barbara Walters, right. Jessica Savage, they were all making names to themselves. So that was, that was really exciting to me. And I was very blessed that I was very successful, even at the high school level. I, I've been on radio technically since Roseanne I was 14. Roseanne Scamardello. <laughs> Channel 5 Roseanne, New York. Roseanne and Dana, Dana right, right. The original right. Roseanne and Roseanne. Yeah, Dana. So, so it was, um, you know, uh, darn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Right. And, and then, you know, falling away from my faith um, while well, I was in the media and then having a very strong right. reversion story. And so I know what it means to just be in the pews. Not that that's, not, that's a bad thing, because we still have to fulfill, mm -hmm. obviously, that obligation. But only to limit your faith to Sunday is not what the Lord intended. He wants He wants to be in our vault in, in our life twenty four seven. Right. Spiritual directors know the ailment as the common cold of Catholic minimalism and religious indifference. And is that something that you find you had that you had to get rid of and yeah. that a lot of people have today? I remember somebody had a book years ago that was something like the least things you can do and still be a faithful Catholic. Now yeah. that's a wonderful yeah, Close that's really motivation, right, motivational. Right, right. Faith, yeah, I, I right. have a chapter in there called um, the Common Catholic Ailments, and then I have another chapter, right. Cure for the Common Catholic Cold. And what Al is referencing in the foreword is, is some of the some of the habits that we get into that are bad habits, where for whatever reason, and my Archbishop Alan Vigneron, who's quoted mm -hmm. in the book as well, right. says that he believes that the reason we, we took this approach is for a long time we were just doing maintenance in the church, you know, maintaining things to the status quo, because people grow grew up, and when we were growing up, uh, it was still where, until the, of course, the secular revolution started mm -hmm. to take hold. If you think about it, most of the world, in terms of the way they viewed things, such as right. marriage and family, was in tune was with Christianity. It was, right. a, it was a Catholic, or, you know, or at least a Christian. Like in approach. movies, in TV movies, and we and had the the Legion of Decency, or what was it, the Legion of Decency, right? That was with the Catholic Church. Catholic they yeah, read, yeah, rank the uh, movies, movies, and, and, and so there was a there was a consistency there, and so everybody just believed what the church taught and went to church, and things right. were things were good. Well, we stayed in that mode, and then the world just came in. And right. so this is what I'm trying to say. There, there are steps that we needed to take that we're taking now through the new evangelization, but we also have to take right. it individually as a Catholic, not just at the parish level. What does it mean to have a disciple's heart? 
Well, I describe it in, my, in, in a chapter where I talk about meeting mercy and mission. You, 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 when you are changed, when you have that meeting or that encounter with Christ and He shows you mercy, and so many of us have, praise God, have hopefully already had that experience, and you are moved profoundly, and I use the analogy from the woman at the well. I mean, mm -hmm. what happened to her? She was basically hiding from the people of the town, so she right. comes in the middle of the day at the well to get the water so she can rush out without being seen and go back home. And she meets God, and they have this encounter, and He shows her mercy, and it changes everything. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that the jug that she went to fill is left at the well, and she goes into town to tell the people about the man she just, she just met. Could he be the Messiah? And she's considered one of the first evangelists. That's a disciple's heart. When you have that encounter, you receive the mercy, then you are sent on a mission as a disciple to, to go forth and to preach in whatever way God determines you're going to preach. Right, and that's the perfect example uh, of the true understanding of what our Holy Father is trying to say about encountering somebody. Right. He encountered somebody, but he didn't leave them mm -hmm. where they were. He didn't just go his head and say, well, you're doing fine. Yeah, you're you've, you've had five husbands, you're living in sin right now, you're good, you're it's okay. okay, it's okay, you're fine. No, right. you encounter them, but then you show them a different way of life. Right. And, and this is what I try to do and, and what, what we do here at EW10 is we try to show people that when the Lord comes into your life, right. there's a great way that you can share that and live it with others. Right, and I thought this was a good point Al made, said we may not all be called to a worldwide ministry like basically what you're doing now, especially with you and your husband Dom. Yeah. Um, but we're called to live a distinct Catholic way of life. So what is a, what is a distinct Catholic way of life that we're called to live? Well, what Al makes always says in, in the opening of his radio show, as you well know, uh, he always says, looking at everything through the lenses of Scripture and the teachings of the church. And, and that's what this is about. Our whole worldview gets altered when we have that encounter with Christ, or it should. And so if we're looking mm -hmm. at everything through the lenses of Scripture and the teachings of the church, every decision we make, what we read, mm -hmm. what we watch, how we spend our time, um, how we pray, how we vote, all of those things are going to be affected by our relationship with God because God is first in our life and we don't want to do anything to displease Him and we want to be a good witness for Him. So that's what that means, really taking on that Catholic worldview and living it out. We say Beyond Sunday is about obtaining true greatness, not in terms of business or worldly success, but from God's perspective. This is everything. And as I've learned from many years of studying the School of Hard Knocks, it's the only thing. And then you, you, you talk about John 12:21 where they come and say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And you say, the book is my personal invitation to you to see Jesus and the Catholic Church like never before. Yeah. So that's yeah. basically Beyond Sunday. Yeah, Beyond Sunday. And also just to, for people to dive in, the one thing that, that just blew me away when I came back to the church is I didn't know one-tenth of what was available to us. And I'm not just talking about the incredible richness of the sacraments that we have available to us in, in the faith. I'm talking about the history. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the saints. I'm talking about the contributions the church has made to medicine, to education, to the world, to art. The amazing gift of the saints and their knowledge and the teachings and the writings. It was like, where have I been all my life? Wow, I could have had a V8, you know, one of those right, moments. Exactly right. And this is what I want people to know about that the, the church is so rich and this, is, this never ending, deep, deep, deep well that we can keep drawing from. And so that's what I'm trying to do in Beyond Sunday. Right. One of the things I thought was uh, interesting, too, because you even refer to your enthusiasm as being maybe a little corny, but you talk <laughs> about he's the number one lifeguard in the universe in the sense of just jump in. Yeah, yeah. Get, get, don't just get your toes wet, go in. Mm -hmm. And I always I always look at the, because I love the beach and I love summer, I always look at Jesus is the lifeguard, right? And when you know there's a lifeguard on the beach, you're going to feel a lot better because it, I'm a pretty good swimmer, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm a little bit leery of, of going out into the big wide ocean without knowing that there's someone that might be able to help me on shore. And then if you see those ropes that are in usually area, if, if a beach has a lifeguard, they also have an area that's cordoned off by ropes in the water. Right. And so you feel much safer and much freer within that because you know you're in a safe zone. You know you're okay. Right. And you can enjoy yourself and you can have a good day at the beach right. and, and get some exercise. Someone's watching you on the shore and someone's watching you in the water. Right. And the culture seems to understand that when it comes to lifeguards in the ocean, but they don't get that when it comes to the church no. and spirituality. No. They think having no guidelines and no rules is what's really freeing. Yeah, which is just the opposite because it results in, in anarchy, basically, right. which we're, we're well, seeing today. Well, either people are afraid to go in the water or they're drowning. Right, exactly. Yeah, and they're drowning in their, by their own unfortunate means because they're, they're taking in all kinds of, of bad stuff from the world. Well, you talk about the idea of uh, pickled pepper Christians, which uh, relates to our Holy Father's view of that. And sometimes people uh, 
can get offended by that on the other side of say, well, what, what, what is a pickled peppered Christian? Is if you stand up for the faith, is that what you are? What do you think he means by that? No, I, he, I, when I remember that quote, and I really liked it because right. my father used to say in Italian, bless his heart, my father, uh, Miguel Annunziato, mm. used to say, no funja face, no mushroom face. In mm. other words, to be joyful. If, mm -hmm. if we have the Lord, not that we're not going to talk about issues in the church and problems that need to be addressed or whatever, but the joy of the Lord is really supposed to be the joy of our Lord, and we're not going to attract anyone to the faith if we look miserable all the time. Uh, scripture tells us that rain falls on the just and the unjust. We're not saying there's never going to be any suffering because there is, but that happens to anyone, whether you're a Catholic or, or right. another religion. But we have such a beautiful theology on suffering in the church that we can still be joyful regardless of our circumstances. And that's what right. I'm getting at here. And also, there are so many people, and I know we've dealt with them, you and I, many people mm -hmm. here at EW10, uh, who maybe will come up to us and, you know, we're just, we're too conservative, we're too liberal, we're not doing this, we're not doing that, or father's not doing this, or right. deacon's right. not doing that. And I, I say this on the air, as you know, look, nobody's saying there's not issues in the church. Right. For crying right. out loud, we know, we, we have full news, news teams that report on that. But we also have to help people encounter Christ, and then we have to figure out what are, what am I doing or what am I not doing mm -hmm. to address those problems or to bring someone right. else closer to God. We have to look at ourselves. I mean, we have to, as Jesus says, pull the plank out of our own eye before we point right. the plank Right, and, out and of our we own have eye. to be positively inclusive without denying truths. Right, exactly. You know, and being welcoming, and, right. and and again, not sitting around looking for what's wrong. Because sometimes you can find yourself coming out of the 70s and the 80s when so much was going on at different times, you'd find yourself waiting to hear the weasel right. words or the right. phrases. And after a while, you'd say to yourself, I'm distracting myself right. from participating in the Mass and getting out of the Mass what I should be getting out of the Mass and my worship because I'm sitting around looking for when right. what somebody well, what, might say, so when's what's the other wrong? shoe going to drop? Right, right. What's I, wrong in the parish? Yeah, here? yeah. I had an email from from a listener not too long ago where uh, there was a story about a particular priest. It was a story actually that you had on uh, EW10News.com, which I use as one of my news sources, by the way. And I was running late, so I had to shorten uh, the story, mm -hmm. and so I ad libbed on the air and, and and skipped to the to the last paragraph, and I left out the paragraph naming this particular priest and mm -hmm. some of the he was one of the priests that was being looked at for some of the heretical things he had said. Mm -hmm. And this man, man emailed me and accused me of protecting this priest and being part of this big campaign against him. And I said, whoa, you're, you're looking at this w w in, in a really, really bad light. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what I'm talking about, trying to have a, a positive attitude, uh, being realistic about the issues, but not being overwhelmed by, by some of the bad mm -hmm. stuff we see, to be well, joyful. Right. And you're saying we need to, with everything going on, you said the sudden prevalence of the me culture coupled with mass media gave the microphones and megaphones to people with a very different message, often directly opposed to the teachings of the church. In some ways, because of the egalitarian nature of media in, in these times, Anybody can say anything, right. and it seems to carry the same weight. And, right. and the idea is, you know, you can, opinions may be uh, everybody's entitled to one. They're not all equally valid. Right, and and there's there is something so, uh, called objective truth, which right. we don't hear about anymore. It's not your truth or my truth. There's objective truth, and you may, as you said, have certain opinions and beliefs, but there is objective truth. Like we are in a studio. Somebody else can say that this is a pool, but it's not. It's a right, studio. Right. But people have gone to that length looking at something and saying it isn't so. Right. And, and I address it in the book as well as what's happened. But Right. This I also thought was interesting. The book is designed to be practical and honest look at where we've been and where we need to go. I've heard from folks around the country, whether it's speaking events or among radio files, that they felt judged or unwelcome by the Catholics who were very involved at the parish level. And, and that is something, too. Many times parishes say, we want more people to get involved. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when one tries to get involved, you find that the people in the parish there already are kind of, well, this is my job. This is my little, this is my little clique. This is my little group. Right. And so I tried to address that because I have heard that, especially from people who maybe have are widowed or divorced, the divorced especially sometimes feel marginalized. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we're getting better at that. I also think new people coming into the church, especially if they're coming from an evangelical setting where our evangelical brothers and sisters are great at all kinds of ministries. They're really good at, at having a ministry for practically everything. I think we can learn a lot from them, but we have to be welcoming. I think the greeters that we're seeing now a lot of parishes is wonderful but really inviting people to maybe the Bible study or you know reaching out in a more direct way right I remember one time uh, I think it was Ralph Martin saying what do you do uh, in your in your uh, prayer group when somebody comes in and plays the guitar better than you or something else like that mm -hmm. and and it becomes a threat 
uh, to your status inside that group. Well, right. You know, so I mean, that's the part we have to step back and say, wh what's the best for the church? What's the best for the parish as opposed to what's the best for me? Outside the box, for many years I kept God and my faith in a neat little box. The box was very attractive because it was convenient and comfortable. Now they always say we're supposed to be thinking outside the box, but what was in your box? Well, my certain set of prayers, you know, the act of contrition, the Hail Mary, the Our Father, and the emergency, help me now, please, Lord, and I'll never do this again <laughs> type, of a, type of a prayer. And when I needed him to approve my plans or, or, or to address something that I needed or wanted, I would take out the prayer box and go to Mass mm -hmm. and ask for those prayers to be answered, and then I would put God away, never really thinking on it about him beyond that. And you got to be all in. Right. You have to just dive in, and you can't be, you know, just having your toes in the water for God. But he's he's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. Right. Your life will dramatically and radically change when you make that full commitment. Right. And it doesn't mean that all of a sudden, because you're now you're a committed Christian, a Catholic Christian, you're going right. to go into full time ministry. But right. your life will be altered in a very beautiful, overwhelming and way. And not only do you have to buy the T-shirt, you have to wear you it. You have to is, wear it. Is that true? Yes, okay. buy it, wear I know you're it. Yeah. Talking about mm -hmm. that. But what about that too? But when you have that experience like yourself and then you come back out and, and again sometimes when people kind of have a conversion it can be a very dramatic conversion sometimes it can be a very slow conversion mm -hmm. uh, but you come out you're different your perspectives different you feel empowered now hopefully in your own situation to speak out about it so now you've got to deal with the pushback from other people wondering what's going on with you oh yeah oh yeah that's tough it's going to happen I had it from my own family where uh, my sisters were very, very, and one of them passed away two years, and we healed our relationship. Thanks be to God, she passed away two years ago. Uh, and they were, who do you think you are, Miss Holier Than Thou? I mean, you were the, the liberal, radical feminist, and this pro-birth control and pro-abortion all the way, and now you're whole, telling us that, that we're wrong. So it was, it was mm -hmm. rough there, and I was still their baby sister, so they didn't want to hear anything They don't from hear me. from you, yeah, right. Yeah, so that, that took, it was just a gradual, I think, living out my faith and, and doing what we felt we needed to do, my husband going to the diaconate, yeah. and we just tried to love them. And right. because you, sometimes the, the hardest people to convince are your relatives, and, and it's not well, going to be Well, we saw that you. with Jesus' relatives, Thank you. right, yeah. as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Isn't this uh, the son of the carpenter yes, here? Yes, yes, uh, yeah. yeah. What are we listening to him for? Yeah, okay, really. Right? What good comes out of Nazareth anyway? <laughs> exactly. Going Beyond Sunday, you've, it, which is the title, but at the end of the chapter, you actually have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every day but Sunday uh, that you set up. Pray and reflect, pray, act, act, reflect, read and reflect. Why did you decide to put something like well, that because, in? Because there is also a, a right. study guide. I wanted it. people to start getting into the mindset of these um, habits or practices that can really help you go beyond Sunday and grow in your faith. One, one thing that Deacon Dom and I have done over the years, and we did it shortly after we came back to the church because we came back through a Bible study, is we do the Mass readings together right. every day. Of course, he's a deacon, so he has his own prayer ritual as well, but we read either Word Among Us or we go on your website, right. or usually it's the Word Among Us or Magnificat. And then we read the daily readings uh, before we both go to work, and then we pray together as a couple. Mm -hmm. And that has made such a profound difference mm -hmm. in not only our relationship as husband and wife, but in our scripture knowledge. And it, it, we have these great discussions about, okay, well, that reading, I know we heard it recently, you know, mm -hmm. and, and looking at different perspectives of the scriptures and just having these great discussions. So it becomes an everyday part of our life. Mm -hmm. And then to reflect, who stops to reflect anymore right. in this, you know, overworked society that was stressed out society that we mm -hmm. live in? People are just jumping from activity to activity. And I think people avoid reflecting right. because they're going to be afraid of what they find. Right, exactly. But you, you have to slow down and you have to give yourself that time. And I think a lot of people do it because I know I did because they don't want to hear what God has right. to say to that's them. A, that's a big one yeah. there too. Yeah. In, the cha in the section on the church as a field hospital, to quote the Holy Father, you talk about holy osmosis, only on Sunday syndrome, chronic Catholic commogenitis, and something else uh, that I'm going to let you pronounce. <laughs> Which one is that? I'm trying the to read. Christoritis. Oh, Christoritis. Christoritis. That is oh, the, the uh, okay. that's basically um, Christmas and Easter Catholics. That is oh, a, okay. a term my, my wonderful spiritual director, who's quoted in the book, Monsignor Bugarin, came up with. But he does it in such a loving way. It's not a condemnation. Right. He, he comes out uh, right before Christmas and right before Easter right. and says, They're coming. They're coming. Everybody's like, Who's coming? And he says, The Christers are coming. And he says, You know, the people who maybe were once like you and only showing up on, on Easter. And Christmas, and then he does this beautiful explanation about welcome them. Right, they are exactly. our brothers and sisters. Right. And remember that you were in that spot maybe a few years ago. They're going to eat your donuts, take your seat right. in the pew, right. you know, take your parking space.
space and let them. And then he sends out a robocall to everybody that's still on the list, even if his, his parish list, even if they haven't been to Mass in years, and welcomes them into the church. So I explain what that is because I had that syndrome. I had all of these syndromes and I probably even invented them. I had so much material to work mm -hmm. with because I made so many mistakes. But it's done in a very down-to-earth, fun-loving way. And I start out that chapter looking at the ailment, saying that this is not meant to be a condemnation, right. to say that I'm holier than anybody else. But this is a reflection of some of the things that I did incorrectly right, right. that led me down a, a very dangerous path spiritually. Right, and, and it may right. be worth a reflection to look at yourself and right. say, when exactly. do I find myself doing that? Like being a little bit of a curmudgeon, the illness is easily diagnosed because the sufferers wear their misery on their sleeves, their faces, and everywhere else on their anatomy. The sufferers are known to their fellow parishioners, Mr. and Mrs. Grumpy Pants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I actually had that experience when Dominic and I came back to the faith. He came back to the church about a year before me. And I can remember being grumpy a lot of time because I was angry that I didn't know what I knew now before. Where mm -hmm. was I all these years and why didn't somebody tell me this? And so I, I was like that person always looking for something negative because I was frustrated. Then I realized I, I, I'm, not, I'm losing the joy that I had when I first came back to the church. So I, at one time, my husband and I suffered from that a, a great deal. So it really, I think, is important for us, again, as Jesus tells us, to pull the plank out of our own eye before we right. point to the plank in our brother or sister's uh, eye. Jumping into chapter four, conscience in the American Catholic. I mean, uh, you talk about one of the reasons many Catholics, such as radio listener previously mentioned, do not consult Catholic sources, is they don't even know that those sources are available, as, and you were listing some of them, obviously, EWTN, EWTN Radio, right. et cetera, the wonderful web sources that are also out there. But it's also this, this misguided idea that your conscience is like equated to virtually your will. Meaning or your that, opinion, your yeah, personal that if opinion. Yeah, I think, if I don't feel bad doing it, then it must be okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I always like to point to uh, Archbishop Shapu, and he's done such great teaching and writing on this. Thank and he goodness says, you for know, him. Right. Yeah, oh my right. gosh, what a, what, a, what a great man. He is a saint, a living saint. What he talks about, if you come to the conclusion after you think you're forming your conscience and your conclusions disagree with that of the church, it's probably not the church that's wrong. Brother or sister, look at the background. So we really have to have to think, are we in line in the way we're acting and living our lives with the church? And what does it mean to have a well-formed conscience? Look it up in the catechism. It's not reading an article in USA Today or, or anywhere or watching CNN or Fox right. News and then saying, I believe this, this is how I'm going to vote or make this decision in my life. No, it's like you look, okay, and God gives us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Right. He gives us a brain and right, we, we are able to, to make decisions, but that has to be in line with the Holy Spirit, Scripture, and the teachings of the church. Right, and again, I think like you were saying, some ways some people say, well, this is what the church teaches, and this is what I hear from everybody else, and I weigh them as if they're equally no. valid, right. when it's not, of yeah. course. That's the right. whole point is, is that one should be in line with the church, and if there's something different than that, there's probably yeah. something wrong with the way you're evaluating the We situation. want all the advantages, and I'm saying this again from my own personal experience, and this is not to condemn anybody. This is just looking back at me right, the way exactly. I used to think, and a lot of Catholics thought, and still think some, where, okay, I want God, but only when it's convenient for right. me. I want to identify as a Catholic, but I don't want to do all well, the Well, that's why people want to become a 24-7 spiritualist. That's right. Or spiritual Spiritualist, person. yeah. Spiritual yeah. person. I'm spiritual, right. yeah. But but being Catholic is, I mean, we are like those salmon swimming upstream. It's, it's not easy. But the thing is, is that there's so much joy and there's right. so much richness. And I've never had more fun right. in my life, a heck of a lot more fun now than when I was in right. secular media. What do you say to people, Catholics out there, who say, it seems like sometimes the greatest opposition to me trying to live out my Catholic faith 24-7 sometimes seems to be the church? Well, I would say I understand that. There are some challenges. They may see some things coming out of Rome or stories and things are confusing or they look at the abuse scandal and we say, okay, fine. I mean, we're not denying that there are issues in the church, but what you have to look at is that the church, even from its very existence, there was never a golden age of the church. I mean, look at the, read the Acts of the Apostles. Right. But those teachings have yeah, been... Yeah, right in the beginning. Exactly. There. I mean, major failure. There. And those teachings have been with us for 2,000 years, and truth does not change. We can learn more about a truth, but the truth of who we are made in the image and likeness of God, the dignity of the human person, life, all those issues that we know are the, are, are the key issues. That does not change, and it is the church that has kept that deposit of faith with right. some good leaders and some questionable leaders over the centuries and with some folks who have some issues, right. but those teachings and the teachings that are life-changing and life-saving, because I know, because right. I've experienced it 
never change. Well, one of the things I always try to remember is the idea that all the great heresies and major issues in the church were started by clerics or bishops, and that it's really the lay people yes, the who lay have people. maintained the faith over the centuries and over the years uh, and, and helped to keep the church strong. Let me ask you just before we go, sure. you put together a study guide with, with Gail Coniglio on this, and what's the point of the study guide? Well, I wanted to help people go deeper, and, and so you read the book, and the book is a, a quick read, because I read like I speak, as you know, it's very conversational, and we have some great points in the book, but this allows them to come together in a small group right. discussion, and so especially people that are new coming back to the faith, to have that group setting, I think, is great right. to, to, to feed off of each other and, and get other insights of what people are experiencing. And then we have a video series, right. too, that's really fun that we did. Very short. Right. I think the longest one is the one we opened up with Al that I think you saw that's about um, six or seven minutes. He gives a great description of how to go beyond Sunday, how to step out of the, the comfort zone. And then it's just maybe two to three minutes each week after they, they read the book and then read the chapter, answer some questions. Just a final thought mm -hmm. to get them understanding the, the Catholic worldview. Right. It's a lot of fun, very laid back, and, and I'm really excited about this, pro this project. Okay, very good. And thank you for having me on. Appreciate well, thank you. it. Always Another book in the works. Um, well, I'm going to be concentrating on this one for a while. I have a couple okay. of ideas, but uh, I really want to see. I, I, my goal is to get and do parish missions with this okay. because I've gotten a lot of requests from, from okay. bishops and also some uh, pastors across the country. So, who want you, me to so you yourself are going deeper. I'm That's trying. terrific. Very good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, God bless Teresa. You. Good to see you again. Teresa Tamio, the one and only Beyond Sunday, becoming a 24 7 Catholic. It comes with a study guide. OSV is the publisher. EW10 Religious Catalog is the place to get it, EW10RC.com. Thanks for joining us right here on Bookmark. We shall see you next time.